Hi guys, this is a continuation of our study on the importance of contentment and realizing that contentment can only be found in Christ. Contentment bears all kinds of good fruit because it involves steadfastness, assurance, thanksgiving, praise, ministry, and basically all good workings of the Spirit. Discontent is a symptom of not entering rest in Christ, and that is a symptom of false doctrine. It means you have the wrong picture of God and His grace and provision and your identity in Christ. I'd like to talk about one particular way that discontent manifests according to the scriptures, and that's in grumbling, murmuring, or complaining, and then what the fruit of that is as well. In Hebrews chapter 3, the author quotes from some Psalm 95, so let's read that real quick. O come, let us sing unto the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your heart as in the provocation and as, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work, forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. So God had delivered the Israelites from bondage out of the hand of their cruel captors in order to bring them into their inheritance. And they knew of God's promises to their fathers and saw him work many miracles among them. And they should have believed him that he was going to provide their needs and bring them into their promised land. But instead they asked him if he just brought them out in the wilderness to die. They craved the leeks and onions in Egypt. They were impatient and afraid and worshipped the golden calf. That's another thing that discontent leads to is idolatry. They murmured and complained because they didn't know who God was. They didn't believe God in spite of how often he'd proven to them that he was fully capable of doing whatever he said he would do. And when they arrived at the promised land... And could have finally gone in to enjoy their inheritance. They thought they were going to have to defeat the inhabitants themselves. And they didn't trust God to do it. So they didn't get to enter in at that time. Since they didn't believe his promise. Um, and you know it's interesting that they sent spies in to spy out the land. And see what they were up against. Rather than just going in with faith that God said that he would bring them in. You know he said he would do it. And they went in and you know they saw the came back and God said they gave an evil report, you know, and the evil was that we have to do this ourselves. God's not going to take care of it. We can't do it. So I guess we can't go in, right? And if you're working yourself to be at peace with God, to have his approval and love and blessings, um, you will never get there. Okay. It's an evil report. It's not a faith. And they sent spies in, which reminds me of those that spy out our liberty in Christ, right? Creeping in privily unaware to spy out our liberty in Christ. We've been taken out of bondage, set free by Christ Jesus. And given great and precious promises by grace through faith. And they want to say, no, you got to work for it, right? It's an evil report about God. And about Christ's finished work. So in Hebrews 3 and 4, uh, we read about this again as a picture of entering into the inheritance that God has freely given us in Christ. Unbelief, doubt, or fear is what causes someone not to enter in. Oftentimes, self-reliance stems from fear. 
because people see God as a hard taskmaster driving slaves instead of seeing him as someone who has set us free in Christ and as Abba Father and ourselves as his children whom he loves and is working all things out for our good. I remember some time ago I was teaching out of Hebrews and someone left me a comment saying that we don't enter his rest until we get to heaven. And until then, we need to get to work. (laughs) And really, that's because he had no idea what rest is or what good works are. He was thinking in carnal terms according to worldly wisdom and definitions, not according to God's ways and wisdom, which is higher than ours, right? Let's read Hebrews 4, 1 through 11 real quick. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world." For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. You know, Christ is our Sabbath rest. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So later in chapter 6, the same author speaks of repentance from dead works, which are works we do to obtain what he's provided freely by grace instead of just believing in faith that he's already provided it. He says in verses 17 through 20, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to shew unto the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil." Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Immutable means unchangeable, no change of position. Our soul, which includes our mind, will, and emotions, however, is changeable, but it can be anchored steadfastly to the hope we have in Christ, knowing that God cannot lie. That's our strong consolation. And consolation here is comfort or encouragement. And this is the same word Jesus used when he said he would send the spirit, the paraclete, our comforter. It also means a legal advocate that declares us not guilty. This is the spirit bearing witness that we're sons of God. And walking according to the spirit and not the flesh is walking in belief or agreement with the spirit in the spirit of sonship as heirs, not as slaves of a hard taskmaster. And doing this is entering his rest. It is belief, and it is by the Spirit that God works in us both to will and do of his good pleasure. When we abide there, we abide in Christ, and we're behind the veil in the Holy of Holies with him. The veil was torn when Christ died. He made the way for us. We enter by faith in his blood that was shed for us as our propitiation, not according to our own righteousness or good works. And it can't be on our own merit or we would fail. We were already judged and put to death with Christ, and now we are alive to God in Christ. Any good works must be, not I, but Christ in me, by faith. That's why it's so erroneous to say that salvation and service are two different things, and only salvation is provided for us, but the rest is up to us, like we're supposed to obtain it by some other means. No, justification is the blessing of the Spirit, meaning I've been brought near to God. And he is my righteousness and good works. And it all operates by faith in his finished work from start to finish. 
When the author of Hebrews said, let's labor to enter his rest, he was using his speech to give an antidote to the dead works of those who were doubting. Remember those that asked Jesus what they must do to do the works of God were answered by Jesus with this. The work of God is to believe on the one whom he has sent. A discontented disposition is the result of a mind that is not being renewed in the word of God. A mind that's not being comforted by the comforter. A mind that is not enjoying the riches of Christ. It's a mind like that of the older brother of the prodigal son working in the field like a slave trying to earn their father's love and approval instead of enjoying his position in the house as a son. A mind that is bitter and jealous when it realizes that some are in the house enjoying the riches there and thinks they have no right to be in there until they've worked for it. The older brother grumbled, just like the Israelites, he was a grumbler. Why? Discontent. He told his father that he'd served him all those years and never transgressed his commandment, but he never killed the fatted calf for him so he could make merry with his friends. And his father replied, You are ever with me and all that I have is yours. This is why we stress that the New Testament ministry is about a will and a testament secured with Christ's blood that has brought us into the household and made us sons and heirs freely with Christ. When we're in the house, we're aware of what the Father is doing. We share his vision and help manage and increase the household by using the gifts he's given us by his Spirit and his working in us as we just trust in him. Jesus told his disciples in John 15, 15, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all things I've heard from my Father I've made known to you. You know, he's letting us in on his affairs, his will, and his vision. And we are in the household both enjoying the inheritance and blessings and bounty of our Father who owns all things and doing good works to increase the household according to his spirit and not according to our own wisdom, strength, and might. Let's look at the parable of the 11th hour laborers in Matthew 20. Where are you? There you are. Um, so in this parable, the householder hired workers for an agreed upon wage of a penny a day. He's comparing this to the kingdom of heaven. And as the day went on, he hired more laborers, some even as late as the 11th hour. And when it came time for payment, they all received the same amount, no matter how long they had worked in the vineyard. And the ones hired early in the morning who'd worked all day, murmured against the good man of the house. There's that murmuring, complaining. And said, Thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered them, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didn't you agree with me for a penny? Take what is yours and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? You know, are you, you know, do, are you envious because I'm generous, right? This reminds me of the reward being reckoned of grace and us all being equal at the foot of the cross. Also, for him to, God to ask them, is it not lawful? Reminds me of the works for Blessing Crowd, who clearly disagree that God is just and justifying sinners, which includes the reward of the inheritance and all spiritual blessings in Christ by His grace alone. They want to keep you in bondage working for what is already yours because they think they are earning it by their works and you should too, right? Misery loves company. Another example of grumbling in the Bible uh, that we're given is in Luke chapter 5 when Jesus called Levi the tax collector to follow him. And Levi made a great feast in his house and invited other tax collectors and sinners to eat there with Jesus. And the Pharisees grumbled against Jesus, asking him why he ate with sinners. And he replied, they that are whole don't need a physician, but those that are sick. Uh, Were the Pharisees whole though? They really weren't, but they considered themselves to be whole. 
If you want to hang out with Jesus and enjoy him, you have to realize your need. No one self-righteous comes to Jesus. They think they have what they need in themselves, and they're disgusted by sinners. And the fact that Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brethren, like it says in Hebrews chapter 2. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Another example of grumbling is the response that many had to Jesus in John chapter 6 when he said, If you don't eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. And many of his followers left him at that time. And when he asked his disciples if they were going to leave him too, they said, Where would we go? You have the words of life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so they stayed because they believed he was the Son of God and had the words of life. Sometimes as believers, we might read or hear some meat in the word that's hard to understand at that time, but we just keep pressing on in faith, knowing we'll all understand at some point as we grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, what choice do we have when we believe Jesus is the Christ and he has the words of life? He is our life and hope. Faith keeps you pressing into Christ, leaning on him as your source, not leaning on our own understanding and religious traditions of men thinking we know how to live this Christian life apart from him. When you realize that Christ is the center and source of the Christian life and you stand steadfast in faith in his finished work, an assurance of who you are in him and how loved and blessed you are in him. You'll be like a tree planted by the water that bears its fruit in season. You'll be like a house built on a firm foundation that cannot be moved. You'll be like a sheep that knows the shepherd's voice and won't follow another and you'll be satisfied in green pastures. Hebrews 10.23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Amen.